Well, good morning once again. It is great to see you. I have a question to start off with today. If I were to ask you, best day ever, what comes to mind? Best day ever. Now, now really what I want to do with this question is, is kind of geared towards um, your day. If there, was, if there was one day that was like your day, what would it be? You know, so it's good to remember your best day ever, but is there a day that's kind of your day, maybe even every year? So maybe it's Father's Day. You know, in Father's Day, I kind of feel a little bit of entitlement. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying I feel it, and I like, and I just, I eat, and I, I, I feel okay a little bit more about my laziness on Father's. It's kind of like my day. Uh, maybe it's Christmas, or, or, or maybe it's uh, your birthday. For my son, uh, he has his day. That, that is absolutely set apart. My 12 year old son, we haven't gotten him uh, birthday gifts in a while, but instead we give him a day. And it's like his yes day. Because you know, you know if you're a 12 year old boy, think back to when you were one, or if you, if you know one. Um, most of the time you're saying to 12 and 11 and 10 year old boys, no, right? Hey, can we, and then your adult response is usually no. Like, we don't have enough time, we don't have enough money, that's dangerous, that's silly, we don't want to be. And so most of the time they hear no. But one day out of the year for my son's birthday, he gets like a yes day, and it's his day. And we just get in the car and we either go south to like Fort Lauderdale area or, or north to West Palm, and we get to stop everywhere he wants to say, hey, can we get a Slurpee? Yes. It's 9 a.m., no problem. Hey, hey, can we go, hey, hey, can you throw me some um, batting practice here at this random field? Absolutely. Let's stop the car. We got the bucket of balls because I know you were going to say that. Let's do that. Hey, can we hit Target? Oh my goodness, I'm really hungry. I want to hit Jack's Hamburgers down in Fort Lauderdale for lunch. How about that? Oh, wait, what about a movie? Yes, yes, yes. And then we usually end up in like some hotel in that place or that place, and he gets to pick it. It's like this amazing day. It's his day. And he looks forward to it every year. Don't even try to cheat him out of his day. Don't come with your lame gifts, because he gets a day. He gets a day. He can get shoes from his grandma. He wants his day on his day. And I was thinking about this message and the reality of today. And I wanted to make a pronouncement before we even started off in our journey here in the scriptures and, and looking at the resurrection accounts and things like that. Is, here's a pronouncement. It's our day, right? Like, it's our day. It is the day that defines all other days in history. The day where a dead Messiah took up his life again and overcame sin and overcame death so that we could do the same. Man, it is our day. So hopefully by the end, when I say that, that won't be a golf clap. That would be like you actually owned it because it was your day as well. And now listen, you might be here and it might not be your day. And that's okay. That's totally okay. You're welcome. You're welcome to explore. You're actually welcome to make it your day as we walk through this. Because here's one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm not always confident in messages that I preach. And this one is, is similar. It's not like I've got like amazing material. It's still me for those of you who are regulars. And if, for those of you who aren't, this is kind of as good as it gets. But here's why I'm confident in today's message. Because I'm actually going to be preaching with this thought that Jesus has gone ahead of me and is meeting each of you exactly where you are. I'm just stepping into that. So if there's something that clicks, if there's something that goes from here to here, or maybe for the first time it just starts here, I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you that's Jesus at work in and through you, so be prepared. So I'm just stepping into that confidence, if you're cool with that. And so if you have your Bibles, that'd be awesome. And if you don't, that's cool, because we, we usually like to put some of our verses behind us. And so I'm gonna take a look at Luke 24. You have a handout for you to, if you wanna take some notes, or if you just wanna keep it to remind you of some of the stuff we talked about, um, there's some space in there for you to write. It'll, it'll help, help you follow along in the message. My wife tells me that the handouts are helpful to her um, because uh, well, she's told me a couple things on my messages. Now, first, one of the things she told me is don't yell throughout the whole message. <laughs> it like loses its effectiveness. <laughs> so I'm just amped, okay? I may have had some cold brew before we started, okay? And it's Easter, it's my day, so I'm a little bit amped, but she, so I'm gonna try to like, I'm going to try to pick and choose my spot. She's like, don't, don't yell throughout the whole message. I think she thinks it's annoying and it loses its effectiveness. The second thing is the outline she said helps her to kind of track. 
because sometimes you know you can go here and there. So if that helps you to track, cool. There'll be some slides behind me that may help you to track as well. So let's take a look at the day that actually made it our day. I'm in Luke 24, uh, and, and I'll just kind of come over here to the screen. We can all read it together. Uh, no, you don't have to read it with me. I just mean with, <laughs> with your eyes. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they, which we're going to find out were um, some first century women who loved Jesus and were part of following Jesus, they went to the tomb. Now, it's important that you understand that Jesus was buried in the custom of the first century, and he, was, uh, he had been crucified, and he was taken down from his cross, and he was put in a tomb, and there was a, a stone that had been rolled over the entrance to secure where this dead man was, because Jesus wasn't any just dead man. He had made some pretty radical claims. And so people were concerned that nobody messed with the body, because if there was a missing body, If there was a missing body. So they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away. Okay, so first, first clue that we're, we're in new territory here is the tomb is not as it was. This huge, heavy stone had been rolled away. Something had happened. I love that. Man, we have to give an account for a stone rolled away when, when not too long ago there was a stone there. Somebody did something. So the, the, the stone was rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. I love um, those few verses up to that point because pretty much uh, I, I would say that if you're here, even if you're not here, most people would agree to that account. Like, like Christian or non-Christian, Jewish, Muslim, whatever the case may be, you, you can get behind those few verses. It's like, yep, I remember, I, I heard Jesus is crucified, and as far as I know, there's been no proof of a body. The, the tomb is empty. And so that, that's pretty good. It's a good way to start a message where everybody's kind of agreeing at least on one thing. The body is missing. This guy named Jesus was crucified, um, but he's not here today. As I look at the account, we're going to meet a few people in this account, and I believe you might meet yourself if you have ears to hear. And so, so who are some of the people uh, in, in this account? Um, again, a, a, a brief history on, on the life of Jesus. Uh, and and for, for those of you who, who may be new to the Christian faith, these are things that, that people who follow Jesus believe. You may not believe them yet. But, but we believe them as true and historical. We're going to talk especially about the resurrection piece of that today. But we believe that truly and historically, there was a virgin named Mary who gave birth to a baby named Jesus. And uh, he was said to be the Messiah uh, that had been promised to the Jewish people, but also to the world in, in totality. Now, the word Messiah means chosen one. He was the one who was going to be the hero of the whole story of humanity. So he gets born, he lives this life, and grows up under a Mary and Joseph as a, as a carpenter's apprentice, and then at age 30, he begins what's called his public ministry. It begins with his being baptized by this name John the Baptist, and, and then um, he, he begins for three years to teach and to heal and to do all these amazing things that if we knew uh, today, uh, we, we would love, we would applaud, we would say, bring Jesus to our city. Let Jesus come here and do what he's doing. But there was one piece about the whole Jesus movement back in that day that was beginning to become more and more disturbing was his claim that um, the kingdom of God had come and it was coming through Jesus. And if you wanted a piece of the kingdom, if you wanted to enter into the kingdom, you had to enter through Jesus. So that was a little bit um, uh, confusing encouraging depending on who you were and, and definitely frustrating and it could potentially make you angry if it threatened the fact that you might have to change your current lifestyle in order to embrace Jesus as the way. So anyways, three years goes by and uh, he had angered enough people to where uh, he, he had his group of uh, disciples who were following him and would eventually go on to change the world and are part of the reason why you're here today. But, but there was another group of people who um, found it to be in their best interest to do away with Jesus. And so they got the, the early uh, Jewish religious leaders, convinced the Roman powers who were in charge that day to uh, finish Jesus, that he was too much of a nuisance, and that 
he was not only a problem to the Jewish people, but he was a problem to the Romans. And it would just be easier to do away with him. And so a guy named Pontius Pilate agreed to that reluctantly. And then Jesus was put on a cross and he was crucified with two other criminals, one to his left and one to his right. And um, during that time, people were mocking him and, and they were um, insulting him and saying, hey man, if, if you're saying that you're the Messiah, save yourself, things like that. And then Jesus dies and his body's brought down. He's pronounced dead by the official, you know, kind of like in charge of things. And he's then, um, uh, he's then put into the tomb. And that's where we pick up our, our narrative here is, is uh, in, a, in a space of sadness where all of the hopes, especially of Jesus' band of followers, who at that time had grown from 12 to maybe we could say around 120, something like that. It, it, it had grown, it had enlarged. Uh, we don't know the specific number, but it, it had grown. there's great sadness. And this is where we enter. And so who's here in this particular passage that we're looking at? Well, we, we see some early adopters. We see some early adopters in uh, the women. Now the women, it says in this particular passage, and you'll see this on your outline there, they're the ones, the angel talks to the women. Now I'm gonna talk you through a lot of the passages it remains. The ain't, there's, there's a couple angels there and they, they have a word with the women and, and here's what they say. They, they remind the women that Jesus at one point in his ministry had said that he was going to die, he was going to be crucified, and then on the third day was going to come back from the dead. Now Christians believe that that's how we're forgiven by a holy God. That a holy and righteous God, because he's got to punish sin or else he wouldn't be holy and righteous, like we would say that to be true of any judge here in Delray Beach, when there's been a serious infraction of the law, there's a penalty, and if the penalty is skipped, that judge is actually like not just. And so Christians believe, those who follow Jesus believe that Jesus um, took our penalty, took your sin and my sin, and, and it was put upon him and, and he took the penalty. He was crushed by the righteous judge, his father, so that you and I could be forgiven. That's the love of Christ for us, is that he would stand in our place and take the full wrath of his father that had my name on it, and then not simply die a martyr's death, but he would overcome that and then give me the opportunity to embrace him by faith as my savior and my master and treasure. And in so doing, by faith, his work, it would become as though I did it. It would be appropriated to me. And because the father had already punished Jesus, he wouldn't have to punish me. He could forgive me and bring me into his family and bring those broken Christians all over the world who come to the end of themselves and say, Jesus, I need you, I'm done with me, to give them the same gift of, of forgiveness and eternal life. And that gift is available today. And I believe that Jesus is working that in some of you, even as we speak, and we're going to give you a, in a moment an opportunity to respond to that. That's the, that's the Christian message. And, and there were some in this passage who, who were early adopters, the women specifically. So the angel reminds them that, hey, this is what Jesus said he's going to do, and then he just did it. And you know what? They're like, oh, yeah. That's right. Now, I could go into the whole, like, women, men thing, and how the women got it way before the men, and things like that. And I could to win the women, but then I might lose the men. So I'm just going to say it was really cool, especially in that culture, where, where if you want to talk about gender equity, it looked like this, with the women way down here and the men way up here, that Jesus says, you're going to get it first, ladies. I'm going to bring it through you. Love that. Love that. Early adopters. Maybe you're here and you're an early adopter. You're like, I heard about this Jesus when I was young. And I was like, oh yeah, that's what I want. Makes sense. I'm kind of an early adopter at age 13. For some reason, God won my heart. And I just started following after him. Early adopter. You might be here. And that might be your story. Cool. There's also some other people here in this story. There's the skeptical supporters. If you see here uh, in verse 11, it says that when the women went back and told the disciples what had happened, here was their response. These words seemed uh, like an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Skeptical supporters. So these people were down with Jesus. I mean, they were, listen, they were his disciples, right? They had left everything to follow Jesus. So they were definitely supportive of Jesus, but they were seriously skeptical. They're like, okay, I, you know, like I know Jesus said he was going to do this, but now you're saying that he really did it? I don't think so. That sounds to me like um, Frozen or Cinderella 
or um, I don't know, some other idle tale. I mean, it's a, it's a really cool story. As a matter of fact, it seems like all of Hollywood has copied the Jesus story and put prince and princess and all sorts of things on it. But like, the world loves this story. It's just that most of us in the world are skeptical, probably supporters. And, uh, and so they, they weren't against Jesus, they weren't against Christianity, but they were just pretty skeptical when it came to some of the supernatural claims. Like a dead guy is now alive again, come on. I'm down for being good and being nice to your neighbor, but I'm not sure I can, I can fully like, like swallow the whole, he was dead and now he's alive and, and, and now I'm gonna have eternal life because of that. I don't know, I decay there, but I'm supportive of it. Like I'll check out your Easter service, that's cool. I'm not anti-Christian. I kind of support the good work that the city house, like some of the good work that Christians do. I'm, I'm not against, but I'm kind of skeptical about like some of the claims. And so, so maybe, maybe you're here because actually you were part of the original crew that heard about the resurrection too. And then maybe you're like my friend Peter. We'll, we'll, call, we'll call that group the, the overwhelmed but hopeful. Overwhelmed but hopeful. In verse 12 it says, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb. So you can imagine Peter, right? Um, so if, if he rose, he was probably seated and, and there he is. And um, A quick shout out to our online crowd. Hey everybody. Good to see you. I hope you're enjoying your Easter brunch and all the things that you get by staying home. We're going to have a, if you want to come to our after party, you can. You're still invited. You can come because it's going to be awesome. Got donuts. Anyways, here's Peter. He's hanging out and he's with the disciples. But listen, if you rewind the clock a little bit, Peter sold out his best friend and it cost him his life. I mean, I don't know when the last time you like kind of sold out somebody, but it probably didn't cost them their life. I mean, maybe it did. I don't know who's here. But here's Peter, and he, denied, he had denied Jesus after he said he wouldn't, after like, he, he's like, Jesus, Biffles to the end, bro, like, you, we're going we're gonna to walk through this thing to the end, no matter what it costs me. And then when push came to shove, Peter's like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. And then Jesus dies after that. And so here's Peter. And uh, I think the appropriate term is he's, he's like overwhelmed. He's in his grief, he's in his shame, he's in his loneliness, like I don't even know, maybe, maybe. More astute biblical scholars here than me today, but I'm not sure how many of the other disciples actually knew what Peter had done at this point. I don't think a lot. I don't think Peter was like, yo, I don't need to confess some sin in my DNA accountability group. Hey, let me, let me share what I do. I think Peter's got it right in here. And so he's lonely and he's filled with shame. And he's just kind of like overwhelmed and trying to deal with it on his own. And he hears, wait a minute. You, you mean what I've done might be undone? I mean, you, you're telling me that like, he might be back? Like I might not have to live in that shame and that loneliness and that overwhelming, gripping fear? Man, I gotta check this out! Because I cannot live like that. Maybe you're here. Overwhelmed. Lonely. Maybe a bit shameful. I don't know. I don't know who's here, but I'm trusting that God brought exactly who he wanted here. I, I want to tell you that it's our day. I want to tell you that it's our day. If you identify with any degree of those people, it is our day. And there's a resurrection message that Jesus wants you to hear. I know it. I know I'm supposed to preach this message as though Jesus were preaching it and as though he went before me and is preaching it to your hearts. And here's, here's how it goes. And, and so I need to address a few people here this morning. Uh, the women in this particular passage, you know what they do? They tell us that it, it's our day for those of you who grieve. For those of you who grieve at any level, I want you to know that the Easter, Resurrection Sunday, it's our day. Now, some of you may grieve on a personal level. Like, you grieve that you're not the person that you want to be. And maybe, maybe you grieve that, um, you know, for you, life hasn't turned out the way that you thought it would. Maybe you grieve that you've missed, uh, like, a, a few opportunities. You know, like, maybe, 
For you, it's, it's one of these things where it's like, man, I wish I would have done this when I was 18, 19, 20, and now my, my, my life looks like this, and I just kind of grieve that. Maybe you grieve a, a previous marriage or a current marriage. Maybe you grieve uh, what, what kind of went down in your childhood or, or what's going down in the childhood of, of those that you're raising right now. I don't know. Maybe you're grieving the loss of like, maybe it's like your first Easter without mom. Your wife or your son. I don't know. I don't know. Cool part about the resurrection is it's a resurrection of it's not over. The message that Jesus shares with the women is it's going to get dark. It's going to hurt. There's going to be a lot of pain involved. But in the midst of that pain, in the midst of that darkness, I need you to know something. It's not over. I'm coming back. And it gets better. Maybe you grieve in a more broader sense. Just like the reality of what happened not too long or not, not too many miles away at Stoneman Douglas. And you're like, how, how is it possible? How is it possible that a good God, that this good God of your resurrection could allow something like that to take place? I mean, I'm... Father, children that age, and, and not too far beyond. It's like, you talk about this, this God, how is it possible? Give me an answer that I can hold on to today that will help me to make sense of something like that. Because you can talk about a resurrection in the future, but I need something for today, man. I need something that makes sense of my reality today. You only need to look to the words of Jesus in this particular passage when he tells the women, I will be crucified, but on the third day I will rise again. It carries all the answers to Stoneman Douglas that we could possibly get our minds around. Why? Because it tells us in his crucifixion that there is sin in the world. That the world is not as it is supposed to be. The account of creation is that God created all things good and, and peaceful. And there is this beautiful shalom between people and God and within people. But God desired relationship. And what people desired was self-autonomy. And when our original parents, Adam and Eve, and then throughout history, chose self-autonomy, they broke the relationship with God. And they also broke the relationship they had within themselves and within this world. And no longer did shalom, peace reign, but brokenness reign, sinfulness reign, sickness reign, shootings reign. Like it all got broken. And we now live in the brokenness of sin. So how did Stoneman Douglas happen? It happened because there is sin in this world that runs rampant at this time. But I want to tell you something. It's not over. It's not over. Darkness has its moments, even, even some days. But because Christ overcame sin, and because Christ overcame death in his resurrection, two things are very, very appropriate and important for you to understand today. Number one, this is a God familiar with sorrows. I would have a difficult time serving and loving and adoring God who was far and distant from what it meant to lose and to suffer and to see his son perish. But because of the death and resurrection of Christ, we know that we serve a God who weeps with the brokenhearted, who is near to the brokenhearted, who understands what it means to see sin have its day, but still invites you to hope that it's not over. It is not over. It may have been a day of evil, but this is our day that defines all other days. And because Jesus Christ has overcome sin and overcome death, there is great hope 
even in the midst of the darkness, because it's not over. You're invited to that same God today. Some of you are here today and you're skeptical. You're a bit, you're, you hear something like that and maybe you've heard it from other people before and, and, and you just, you get a little skeptical. You're like, man, I, I don't know if I can, I'm not sure about that. Man. That, that just sounds like, like you're passing over something. It's, it, it sounds like, man, I'm, I'm not sure that, that, that I can really believe that there's a God that enters into my suffering, so will, will suffer with me as Christ suffered for me, and then will see me through to the other side and bring hope and comfort and healing in the midst of something that is so devastating. I'm not sure I can buy that, man. I'm skeptical. Or maybe you're here today and you're curious. You're like, I've never heard it like that before, but I know it's better than what I have right now. And I'm curious. So go on, little guy. Preach on a little bit longer. Maybe you're curious. Man, you're, you're in good company. I, I brought some help with me today because um, I, I'd like to just briefly make a historical case for the resurrection because you can walk out of here and think, well, that guy... To where he meets a lot of people in his resurrection scenes, which is over a moon over a feast. There's a feast of rich food that Jesus has prepared for us. I want to read it to you as we close. It's in your outline if you want to look at that with me. And, and this is where we this is where we invite you to that particular feast. Around here we call it a better party. And we believe that um, Jesus is inviting us all to a better party. One where he's at the center and can give us the things that we look for in other places but we can never find. Isaiah 25 verses 6 through 8 says this, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich foods. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. Now I just want to invite you to that feast. I want to invite you, even as we play our last song, it's going to be talking about resurrecting things. Like, I want to invite you to that feast. I want to invite you, not to the one that we have out there, although it's going to be awesome, but I want to invite you first to the feast named Jesus. That you would simply come, and if you've never given your life to the resurrected King and experienced all that we've talked about today, that you would take a step of faith, and you would actually come forward, and you would allow yourself to be prayed over, that people would walk you through and pray the resurrected Christ to be your reality, to be your feast, to be your better party today. I just want to call that out to you. We'll pray for you for any reason you might have, but there are many, I think, I don't know how many, but there are certainly some who need to come forward and receive Christ today for the first time as their Savior, as their Lord, as their better party. This is, this is your time to do that. Because here's what I know. Jerry sits in the front row. He's been in a wheelchair for a few years. He's looking for that better feast. I met with him yesterday, last week, and we talked. And I said, you know what, Jerry? You've got some things that you're waiting on for Jesus. And I've got my own brokenness. And it's a brokenness of my mind and my heart that doesn't work the way I want it to. I walk through anxiousness all the time. And I hope and I wish for different, but what I'm really doing is I'm waiting for King Jesus to return and restore all things. So this is our day. This is our day. This is where this message came from. And I believe it's more than just Jerry and my day. Amen? Yeah, let's sing. Yeah! Yeah! I know it's March Madness time, and I know there's some celebrations, but that was much better than our initial ball clap, and much better than you're going to see tonight or tomorrow night, because not only are we celebrating something that gives us temporary happiness, joy, satisfaction, but we're, we're celebrating something that defines all our days, both now and to come.
our resurrected Jesus. Amen? Amen. So two things. I want to let you know, our prayer partners are going to stay here for a little bit. Not by the, you're like, maybe I'm not going to go up in front of people. That's kind of weird to you. That's cool. That's okay. Now it's not going to be weird. Because everybody's going to be gone. Because they're going to hang out for a little bit. But if God was doing something in your heart, what would be really weird and dishonoring and, and just unhealthy would be to ignore that. That, that would be weird. So I would encourage you as everybody kind of goes that way, and we release parents, if you'll go first to get your kids, and so we're going to set up an Easter egg hunt that's going to happen in just a little bit. If there's two of you, one of them, one of you needs to stay, then stay. We're going to stay, we'll play a little bit of music behind me, and we'll just create an atmosphere for you to keep coming and responding to what God, no matter who you are and what you're doing, it's always good to respond to community. And so these people are going to stay here for a little bit. We'll have our Easter egg hunt and our festivities shortly. Food will be out and ready to go right now. Just want to thank you guys for being here and choosing to celebrate with your family. Resurrection you. Sunday with us. Thank you. Let me ask a benediction over you. Now, Jesus, you are the risen one, and I want to speak directly to you. And I want to say that because you live, we now can live. Because you overcame sin, now we can overcome sin. Because you triumphed over things that were seemingly impossible, now we can triumph over things that are seemingly impossible, both now and in the age to come. So Jesus, we know that that is the promise that you have for those of us who will come and receive it. Outside of those promises, there is hopelessness, and this is not our day. So I pray that we would... By faith, place ourselves in your favor, Christ, and receive this free gift of salvation. And we would say yes to you. And we would say no to our current life and yes to the better part that you have offered through your death and resurrection. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Do that work among us. We pray those promises over those who would receive it today, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Love you guys.